Assalamu alaikum, peace and love. Welcome back to the Travelers Podcast. This is Brother Ali. Uh, for those of you that are watching on visual platforms, you will see that this is not my studio in Istanbul that I'm recording from. Uh, for those that are listening on audio-only platforms, you'll be able to hear that my voice got a little touch of extra raspiness in it. And both of those are true because I'm not in Istanbul. I'm in America uh, doing the Travelers Tour. A string of concerts, mostly on the West Coast, to celebrate the podcast. Also to celebrate that after all these years of touring, and then this kind of like forced two-year hiatus, that we finally get to be in a room together again, singing songs together, and moving together, and breathing together, and sharing space, and just our, our bodies responding to one another. It's a very, very beautiful thing, and I really, really missed it. And it's, you know, I think it's special for everybody there because I've been to plenty of concerts as a, you know, as a, as an observer, as a, as an audience member. But then I have to tell you that when you're the dude on stage or the the artist on stage, and these songs, as mine do, and I think most people do, your songs come from the, these innermost parts of yourself, the highs and lows and joys and woes, all the things that you hope and desire and dream and imagine and remember, you know, all of these things go into the songs. And then to bear those in public and have a room full of people singing along with you and connecting with you and giving you all this appreciation it's really really powerful so the stage part after 18 years of doing this thing you know i've been doing it for 20 the first 10 years brendan kelly bk1 the producer of this podcast was my dj and then after that i did about six years with my man last word who's my current dj and uh so then we had two years off so it's been 20 years total 18 on the road and when we say we did the road we did it for real like we did hundreds of shows every single year over 100 shows, sometimes 150 shows in a year that means you're on stage a as often as you're not you know and then there's travel days and all this stuff so you know we really got acclimated to the road and we were on the road more than we were home. And then we had a two-year kind of forced hiatus. So being back on stage is, you know, they call it rat, like riding a bike. To me, it's like breathing. It's like a fish swimming. Like, I, this is where I'm at home. There's a certain element of myself that only really lives on the stage. And it's a very beautiful thing, and I love it. The travel part, I can't front. I'm, I'm used to being at home. I'm used to being you know, physically present with my, my daughters and my wife, and I miss them like crazy. But I'm really happy to be out here. Go to brotherali.com slash events, and you can see all of the dates. Uh, you can also get your tickets there. Uh, there are also VIP packages where people you, you get to come in early if you opt for that package. You get an exclusive t-shirt. We do an intimate musical performance for you. And then we spend about an hour just doing an a intimate conversation, Q&A. It's been really dope. I'm really, really grateful for it. Um, just want to run through a list of the cities. We have Bellingham, Washington, Portland, Oregon, Seattle. State Line, which is basically Lake Tahoe, Sacramento, Berkeley, Santa Cruz, Fresno, Santa Ana. We have Tempe, uh, Tucson and Phoenix. We have Albuquerque, Santa Fe, Durango, California, Salt Lake City, Fort Collins, Colorado, Denver, Colorado. And then we do a few in the Midwest. We have Omaha, Nebraska, which is one of my favorite cities to perform in. It's also one of the cities that Malcolm X lived in. St. Louis, Mo. Uh, shout out to Chris Calico and Tech Nine and all the fam down there. And then we do Chicago and then Madison. Um, every time we announce a tour, it's the same thing. People are always like, no love for my city. Like, yo, I'm one person <laughs> and I can't go everywhere on every single tour. And it's, and it's a huge investment and commitment and it's a lot of work to go on tour. So be a little bit patient with us. This is the West Coast leg. We hope that there are more legs of the tour coming. So again, go to uh, brotherali.com slash events and uh, we hope to see you on the tour. Today's episode of the Travelers Podcast is extremely special. When we talk about music, and art and culture and public figures, there's words that we overuse and we overuse, particularly I'm, I mean that we overuse words like icon, like legend. My guest on the podcast today is Chuck D. And Chuck D is the reason why those words exist. If we talk about music and particularly uh, protest music or message music, if we're talking about uh, black music, if we're talking about American music, if we're talking about hip hop music, rap music, Chuck D is one of the most iconic legends 
to ever do it in any time period. And we're very, very, I'm very grateful to consider him a mentor and a teacher and a friend and a brother. And I'm very grateful that he's here. When I was thinking about how do you introduce Chuck D? Like there's really no way to do it without wronging him because it's impossible to say it all. You know, we we could talk for hours and hours about Chuck D and, and his impact on me and on the world and on culture. You know, I was sitting there watching uh, The Office with our eldest daughter, me and my wife and our eldest daughter, and Ryan on The Office, who looks a lot like BK1, the producer of the podcast, by the way. But he says something, and he makes some little joke, and he kind of jokingly says, yeah, fight the power. And I turned to my daughter, and I'm like, do you realize that Uncle Chuck is the one that wrote that song? Now, of course, there was a song before that called Fight the Power, but people are referencing public enemy fight the power. I think it's impossible to overstate, and it's important not to understate, the the epic nature of Public Enemy. They came along in the mid 80s, and you know, really in the late 80s, they really became very, very strong and mighty. And at this time, just to put in some context for where rap music was at at that time, Run DMC had just started to perform alongside Aerosmith. So hip hop music wasn't really recognized. It wasn't being played on black radio. You'll hear Chuck talk about that. It wasn't even really being recognized as a real musical form, even in the black community, even within black music. And so you have Run DMC on the one hand, and uh, on the other hand, you have uh, Will Smith, Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince win the first Grammy uh, for hip hop music, for rap music in 1988. So Public Enemy bursts onto the scene, not only as a hip hop group and becomes larger than life, as big as any rock band, like they toured with U2. You know, they, they were among the biggest groups in the world and, and remain that way. They still are that. But also they did it doing this very militant, very unapologetically pro-black, uh, you know, uh, message and marketing and iconography and imagery. And one of the things we talk about in this episode is the fact that, you know, Chuck really insists on keeping community involved with with music and with art and with culture. And so Chuck has also always really paid attention to how do we use technology to promote community and culture and to insist upon community and culture. Community, culture, family, togetherness, the group dynamic as one of the forms of revolution. You know, part of this society that we live in that's one of its many illnesses is that it's hyper-individualist. You know, this idea of like the self-made, the self, you know, the self-made success story. It's a lie. You know, the reality is that we come from communities, we come from culture, we come from families, we come from a circle, we come from a, a team. And so Chuck has used radio to do that and cultural curation. But also when Chuck became the leader of Public Enemy, you know, what you saw on stage was amazing. So you have Chuck D, this great mouthpiece, this great orator, this great, um, you know, storyteller, this great, um, you know, nothing short of an amazing speaker, you know, that, that conveys the message and is the leader and has this very stoic presence. But then he added the contrast of Flavor Flav. So Flavor Flav is almost like the court jester, you know, and and Flavor Flav brings some levity and some humor because that's part of community. And then the DJ, Terminator X, is also a very stoic figure. Now there's DJ Lord, who's amazing, when Terminator X left the, left the stop uh, touring. But Terminator X had these big glasses and was very stoic. And then you also have Professor Griff, the Minister of Information, and the S1Ws who are, who are dressed in military outfits and are drilling and, and saluting on stage and doing paramilitary workouts on stage. You know, and sometimes they even had they, they even had uh, you know theater weapons on stage, and then also you have Sister Soldier, who is you know an artist, but she's also a speaker, a spokeswoman, an orator, an educator, a lecturer. I mean, go watch Sister Soldier on the Donahue Show. Go watch Sister Soldier during that time period. So, you know, to have a woman be in that in that role alongside Chuck D and alongside Professor Griff and Flavor Flav. And then also they mastered 
uh, iconography. You know, Chuck uh, created the la- the logo for Public Enemy, which is iconic. And they also mastered film, you know, and they mastered video. Go watch the video for Night of the Living Bassheads. Go watch the movie, Do the Right Thing. It, the song Fight the Power was created for that movie, and it's a it's a character in the movie, you know. And to this day, Fight the Power remains one of the most important protest anthems of all time. So this conversation, just to give you a little context, is me and Chuck D, we recorded this at a, a midnight. You know, Chuck was, uh, he was traveling in New York City. He lives uh, in on the West Coast. He flew home that day. And then he also picked up his daughter and helped his daughter and took care of her. He also, as you'll hear towards the end of the episode, was ushering in his wife's birthday, which was a major milestone birthday for her. And so Chuck went from being in travel mode to being in full dad mode. And I think it's so perfect because of how down to earth and accessible and just real a person Chuck D is. Uh, and so we caught him late at night. I came into this interview with all these, you know, thinking about it as an interview. I had all these questions and all these things I wanted to talk about. And I did all this research and I prepared and had this outline and everything. That, And then a few minutes into talking, I realized this is not going to be that. That's not the That's not the mode that Uncle Chuck is in. He wants to hang out and talk the way that we talk. So what you hear in this episode is me and one of my most amazing teachers, elders, mentors, friends, comrades, just having a conversation about his observations. And sometimes, you know, we sit with our elders. Chuck is maybe 15 years or so my elder. And, you know, maybe 17, actually, 17 years my elder. We sit with our elders sometimes, and we it's just important to... to find out what's going on in their mind to just check in with them what are their observations you know and we contribute in the conversation but it's a really really tremendous gift to just be able to get on their page and to listen to them and to hear their reflections on what they're observing because of the fact that they've lived so much life and that they've just been here you know observing for so long so uh, we're brought to you this week by the Zakat Foundation and by Roots Community Birth Center and by UPF and by Vice Gerent. And I'm very, very happy. This is a really dope episode. I'm really grateful, really happy and proud. So enjoy this episode of the Travelers Podcast with Chuck D. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. It's okay to do the whole interview in Arabic, right? Salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa Well, you know, I trust you. <laughs> that's, the most, that's the most important. I trust you. Man, you know? I'm so grateful to have you, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for going through all the technical stuff. And it just means the yeah, world. We should, let every, we, we, we should let everybody know, man, that, that uh, we're trying to be on top of the technology instead of it ruling us, you know. Well, you and always um, say that the phone is either a tool or a toy, depending on how you use it. Phone saved us on this one, bro. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, it's uh, we're using it as a tool on this one. So here we go, right? God's good. So if I want, if it's okay, I want to start with a story. I like to usually start with stories. I'm always able to track exactly when our relationship started because we met the day that my eldest daughter was born. My wife had to right. be induced, um, and so they planned it. And they said, you know, we're going to do it this Wednesday. And I, I told her, I was like, that's the day I'm supposed to have this event with Chuck D. And she was like, well, how long does it take? She asked the doctor, how long, the midwife, how long does it take once they start the induction? And I'm like, it's usually like 10 hours before anything starts happening. She was like, you better go do that Chuck D thing. And so uh, me and you sat and we started talking and you told me, you said, you know, stay close to your parents if you can. Stay close to your imam or your sheikh or your priest if you can. If you have a therapist, stick with your therapist, but artists need artists. There's certain things that artists are going to give you that nobody else can give you. And then you told me, you, you gave me your number, and you were like, the one thing you need to know is I'm regular. As long as you treat me regular, then we'll be good. And it's true. Like, you're the most accessible, down to earth icon that I've ever come across. And I know people that try very hard. 
like Dave Chappelle lives in Yellow Springs, Ohio, and walks around and goes to the coffee shop and will talk to anybody. And Dr. Cornell West, you know, if he meets people throughout the day, he just brings them with him. You know what I'm saying? And at the end of the day, he takes the whole crew that he met all day to, to, to dinner. But those people are trying very hard, but I've never known another icon that's as real and accessible and authentic and just down to earth as you are. Did you ever have a moment, though, early on where you're like, yo, I'm I'm a famous person. Like I went from being Chucky D on the radio to being like a famous man. Did you ever have that moment? But thank you for all that. I think I'm a very accessible. I don't think I'm an icon. So I think I'm an I can. Because if it's reachable, I think I can try to do it. But um, I came from a crew aesthetic. So coming from a crew aesthetic, you know, you you can never rise to 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 any, you know, perch because you get slapped up inside the crew nonstop. Yeah, I'm the leader. But at the same time, with effort, you're always trying to bring up the bottom. Mm-hmm. So you're always at the bottom. Like you're at the bottom a lot more than like, let's say somebody who's just part of the like the road crew. You underneath them, you know. It's like you know, so, um, you know. I mean, I guess maybe in when you're out there on the tour and perform. So I remember our second year, and um, we just smashed the, the Philadelphia Spectrum, smashed it, right. Mm-hmm. But two nights in a row, the first night, 20,000, you know, smashed it, like, bam. And so you got the day, the next day we playing. No, I think the the next show was two days later. Mm. So we got the day off in the middle, and I'm walking around the streets, and I was kind of like floating, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But this is also, this is also before the time of video, visual exposure. You're heard, you're not seen. And I came from an aesthetic of always really being heard and not seen and happy with being unseen because mm. you know you, you do a radio so you really i mean i didn't want to be seen we brought a visual guy to the table and that's flavor who always want to be seen and that was <laughs> enough for me so this was like back in the day so, yeah, so i could go you know i'm not i'm not six feet i could get in a lot of circles i could i could be right behind people I mean, I, I've snuck on a, up on a lot of people, man. So to make a long story short, yeah, it, it it hits you when you're in a public space, but I always, for somehow, worked on being invisible in a very visible spot, almost like, like a Harry Houdini. I could just, like, flip around, turn a hat backwards, you know, be unassuming, don't look anybody eye to eye, and I could get anywhere. Mm-hmm. You know, and then in your regular life, you know, you're doing things like, you, you know, I mean, you're going from everywhere from getting the car fixed and washed and to changing diapers, going and in the gro- changing diapers, going yeah. to the grocery store. Um, I think I posted the other day on social media, like if there ain't no chairs inside the airport, I'm sitting my ass down. On the floor. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right there, right. right on the floor, right? Yeah. So, you know, some people are like, oh, man, I couldn't picture, you know, you sitting on the floor and all that. I'm like, yeah. So um, I was definitely uh, blessed to have grounded parents, grounded people around me. And um, I've never really had a, I had a, I've never had a problem with going wherever I wanted to go. And I, I taught guys like Ice Cube. Mm-hmm when they was getting to that level of visual fame. Because, mm-hmm. you know, Ice Cube had, he had NWA fame, but visual fame came in the 90s when Cats was making videos and they really started to be recognized and they started getting in movies and whatever. Yeah. And so visual fame is another thing, man. And I got visual fame, but I, I, I shrouded it in the with a lot, a lot of people around me and surrounding it. And, and although I was very visible, I didn't I didn't raise the visibility to the point where I'm on every movie and things like that or I'm doing a TV show. I was visible but I wasn't visible in my own choices. So I was I was helped by coming up with something that was going to be good for my life. Mm-hmm. And I and I, and it's just like your life. You got to design your life. And even when you make you design your life, you know, man plans, God laughs. So, right. you know, you you come up with half a life and and life is going to write the other half. Mm-hmm. And but you but plan anyway, you know what I'm saying? Design anyway. Um, design 
whether it's life, your goals, your plan is a, it's a good thing. It's a good yeah. thing to design and, and, and to plan and lay out something. And it might not even end up as you, as you planned it, but that's mm-hmm. not for, that's not for you to question anyway. I mean, speaking of design and the visual piece, even if you didn't feel like you were as visual, you definitely had a vision for what the visual representation of the group would be. You know, that, that you all mastered video very early. You mastered mm-hmm. the visual aesthetic of the crew very early with the S1Ws and the, just the look of Terminator and Griff and Flav and yourself and the S1s. And then you designed the logo for, for the group. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you look at these, these, these major iconic, you know, rock bands and movements that they had these logos. But didn't you originally design that logo for another crew that you yeah. read about on a I flyer? designed it. For, we used to do a lot of promoted, uh, promotions and I did, you know, funky ass blazing flyers to mm-hmm. try to get more people in. I mean, I met Hank first, Hank Shockley. I met him because... I went to a, a Spectrum City gig and they was the top DJs and nobody was in the gig. And I said, the reason nobody's in the gig because you advertised it wrong, man. I'm mm. your, I'm your, one of your biggest fans and ain't nobody in there. He wasn't uh-huh. trying to hear me until he heard me accidentally or coincidentally at my college where everybody used to convene because that's where they had Black Knight and he heard me on the mic and he was like, dude, you the dude that came to me with fly... You, that dude on the mic was you. I'm like, dude, I'm only on the mic to sit whack dudes down. That's all, man. Cause mm, they they, mm, mm, mm. they 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 crushing my my dance game. I'm just trying to dance to the joints <laughs> in here, man. You know, you I dance with once, a girl. It's yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. I'll, no, I was just say saying that uh, I, one time Arsenio a- asked you. He was like, "Yeah, Flavor is always dancing. You don't really dance." And you told Arsenio, "Like, we're all black. I can't dance." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, you better. I mean, I mean, I come from a time where we, where dancing was the, was the thing, man. Mm-hmm. You know, look, I'm born in 1960. Mm-hmm. I, I was in high school during disco. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, I'm in, I'm in college, my second year of college, right when Rap is the Light comes out in that first, it's fall semester of 1979. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. in college. If you have your dance on. I mean, leaning up against the wall was not acceptable. That became uh. something later on. I, you know, the girls at the party, you had to also crack the ice and come out of yourself and ask them would they like, you know, would they like to dance and how mm. you approached them. You know, you got your dance on. And if you mm. didn't da- dance, you was what they call wallflower. You up against wallflower. the wall. Why, right. why are you even there? You know what I'm saying? That yeah, became if- acceptable later on. I, things that you could, you know, you was even un- inconceivable, like, Later on, oh, there's a, a part, you know, a wedding you go to and all the girls dance together and the guys stand and they drink and talk. I mean, that it was inconceivable, man, back in, <laughs> in, in, in the 70s and the 60s, man. Everybody yeah. got their groove on, man, and that's where I come from. So that Hank heard me, you know, back then, you know, everybody thought they could get on the mic, and, you know, mm-hmm. and, and like the real intense area period of hip hop. Right before records, man. Just because somebody came from the Bronx or Brooklyn, they just thought that because the neighborhood was all hip hop, that they was hip hop coming to college too. It was like, nah. So they would get on the mic when, you know, Good Times or Love is the Message would be playing. And it was terrible, bro. It was terrible. And I, I would tell my boys, I said, listen, man, you know, I, if I'm asking the girl to dance, number one, I ain't come. I'm, I'm you, you, you're not like one of them pretty boys. Right. So all it takes is one mess up for somebody yeah. to say, I don't feel like dancing no more. So, you know, you got game, but you, I mean, you get your game, you're trying to get up a case game. And the dance <laughs> is important. Mm-hmm. And all you need is a dude that's whack on the mic or whack on the turntables for somebody to say, excuse me, um, I don't want to dance no more. And you're I like, think we're about at- to leave. Yeah, I exactly. think we're about to go like, now. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I would tell my boys, i say, you know what? I'm going to get on the mic. And then when I get on the mic, nobody's going to get on the mic. And sure enough, boom, they play, a, a, you know, one of the beats, the good times or whatever. Everybody want to get on the mic, throw their rhymes. Everybody have bars or whatever. Then when I got on the mic, Cats is looking at the mic like, yo, like, that's good. That wasn't the same mic I had. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yes, <laughs> and then, sir. And then the line behind me is, is all of a sudden gone because I'm not, just I'm not start, getting on the mic. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> exactly. But you know the same I thing, think Ali. I my you know iron Ali, you know the same thing because after you get off the mic, nobody really want to get on the mic. It's like, yeah, I can't sound like that. <laughs> you know? Hey, and you come from a time, we you you come from the time, well, I come from a time, but also you carry that on where sound was everything, man. Yeah. Sound or yeah. uh, sound of like what's coming up out of you. No yeah. tricks, no machinery. It's like, mm -hmm. yo. I mean, I'm the first time hearing you. I'm like, yo, man, I don't know where he's reaching down into, but he's reaching into some places and pulling and them rides is them rhymes is riding something else. I'm and reaching they, to the, they, to they the inspiration that you get that I got from you. I'm I'm no, reaching, no. literally reaching, reaching into from, a time when you made me that. feel like, man, well, and, and from whatever you, you know, from that, which from what you're pulling, you know, I but, would be saying, man, Ali is rhyming from his bone marrow. Hmm. You rhyming from the bone marrow, man. It's like, yo, man, it's like whatever. Yeah, the inspiration comes in the middle of all that. Mm -hmm. But when you, you go into your rhymes, which is going into your flow, which is going into some other, like, oratory, it's you coming from the bone marrow, man. And, and I don't, I, it's, some, it's coming from somewhere else, but you already know that. I mean, it's 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 literally from it's literally from feeling powerless when I was little, and then mm -hmm. hearing you and hearing Malcolm because of you, and hearing mm -hmm. Dr. Khaled Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan because of you, and then hearing Chris, and then hearing like these voices and the combination of and this is what I'm saying like you there's really a psychological element to the overall presentation of what what you offer, you know. Mm -hmm. All of these elements that you brought together when you talk about, you know, the idea of marketing and the idea of having the flyer look right, having the music look right, mix blending the music right, having the, the vocal be right, the visual being right. You know, I think about also the way that uh, the way that you start your rhymes, you know, the, the you, you have the mm. best opening lines of anybody. I got a letter from the government or back mm. or mm. I got so much trouble. And then your mm. use of, you know, you hit them with that first lyric and then you give them a second to digest it. And then you go into the, the joint. And all of those things together made me feel powerful. It made me feel like this world doesn't have to be the way that it is. It, mm. it made me feel like the world, you know, my friends don't have to be in the condition that they're in. You know what I mean? It felt like everything was possible because of, of what you created and yeah. then everything that you connected us to, all of the things that you pointed us to. I remember you said once you were talking to, in, in, the, in the record, you said you check out the books they own. You know, and I remember like thinking about, man, what books does Chuck D own? And I would stand at bookstores and I, I can't even see, like, you know me, like you've seen me trip over stuff and like squint to like, you know what I'm saying? And there's times where I'll meet people First time I met Pete Rock, like Kwali was was like, "Yo, meet my man." He's like, "Man, this is Brother Ali. He's an amazing MC." And I'm standing there because you know Kwali roll with anybody, right? Right, and I, right. Not anybody, but I mean, he you know he brings a lot of people around. So I'm like, "Oh, uh -huh. how you feeling?" Da da da. Yeah, nice to meet you. I'm just being polite. And then I walk away, and he's like, "Oh, have you met Pete Rock before?" And I was like, "Damn, I didn't even know it was Pete Rock." But I used to stand at at the library and at the bookstore and at a magazine aisle, and I just used to look at books like, "What does Chuck D read?" You know what I'm saying? Like, because that's what I need to have, you know, in the arsenal. But I think that, you know, there's something when we when we use that term iconic, there's definitely iconography. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely um, an overall psychological effect that you're that that you and the crew were able to create. And I feel like so much of it comes from the way, you know, your upbringing and definitely want to, you know, talk about that but there's something about that that radio element as well uh -huh. you know what i mean that you you bring the entire legacy of black music with you uh you know it's very similar to to a dj squad that you can bring uh -huh. in all of these different elements and when you listen to public enemy music it feels like radio like brendan was saying earlier today we were talking about he's like there's no dead air in a public enemy it's record better you know not what be I mean? better not be because number one we're not coming with anything that's conducive Nothing's really pretty. Um, mm -hmm. There's not a lot of minor minor keys. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's not dark. It, it, it's just, I, I mean, it's anti-music a lot of the time. So you could get anybody on your rhythm and on your pace if you if you kind of like boom hit them right away. Like that's a Barry Gordy thing. You know, don't don't let the first four seconds sleep. <laughs> you know. And yeah. then once you got them, you better keep them and you got to keep them on that rhythm. It's almost like, it's 
it's almost like if you rhyme to something off beat, but then again, mm -hmm. then your rhyme is the beat after that. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, you rhyme to something off beat, but then once you catch it, you catch it in that certain sprocket, then that beat is yours then. You claimed it, like Rock Yeah, you start doing Pharaoh Monch. Yeah, yeah, but Pharaoh Monch, right, right. Pharaoh Monch just basically takes a basket and just puts the be beats. Yeah. <laughs> Walks like around like Felonius Monk. Yes. Like it's yes. Felonius Monk. It's like, you know, if you were to try to transcribe that, someone would look at it and maybe say, like, this isn't, this is incorrect. But there's right. something about that that's just so right. Right. That that it, it 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 redefines the music. Like they're not rhyming to the beat. The beat is trying to is is holding to them. Right. Well, there's 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 not a lot of words for this anyway. I mean, mm. you know the, the heartbeat is a heartbeat. So mm. if the heartbeat is a heartbeat, and living organisms on the planet Earth, you know, it's governed by gravity and all kinds of other things that that God makes possible. I mean. That beat means something. If the mm -hmm. beat then means something, then we we would have we would be off beat all the time. My heart mm -hmm. would be bump, and then when it feels it got to go bump again, everybody would have you know a choice on when it goes bump. But everybody's heart and and living on this particular planet and its best working order usually kind of is the same beat and go boom 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 boom. boom. Right. Boom, boom. You know, you get somebody on a drum. Boom, 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 bap, boom, boom, bap. You know, it's like so. Got that? Yeah, right. So louder, right? So there you go. A beat is not one of these things on tempo, Jack. That's what I'm saying. You know, it's like it's not one of these things that's alien just to music. A beat is inside of us. So why right. would a beat be foreign to us? Why would music be foreign? Everybody got music in them. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, the key is just like we're art. Everybody has art in them and everybody has music in them. But then you need teachers. You need people to help you help sometimes bring the music out of you. And right. some, a yes, lot sir. of people really can't bring the art and the music out of them, which makes them drawn to art and music. Or, yes, sir. You know, and then when you throw consumption in it and commerce in it and you throw all this stuff in the middle of, of the relationship then you you got mm -hmm. something else but that does not mean that it ain't real mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying it, 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 it's real i mean music is real art is real when you talk yeah. about human beings and um right. Yeah, it, it is, and, and, it, and then it inherently will remind the human beings of their shared humanity, mm -hmm. like the, just the existence of art, the existence of aesthetics. You know, it's one of the reasons why, like when me and my family wanted to move to a place, a Muslim place, a Muslim environment, like we chose Istanbul because right. of the fact that there's aesthetics and beauty and drumming and, and singing and and, and yes, documentation sir. inside the, the yes fabric of everyday humanity and life you know it, it's right it's woven in not consciously it's woven in yes. like it's just a matter of just who we are and what we are and just the mere presence of it reminds everybody of the shared humanity just the right. mere presence of of you know poetry you know you think about the fact that like poetry used to be part of public life man like po like people used to memorize poetry they used to know poetry and then after a while it, it got to a point where Music is the only thing that does that. And, you know, it's it, like even just acknowledging that there is a world of meaning that's mm -hmm. bigger and before and after the material reality. You know what I'm saying? And you think about for all of the talking and all the, the, the reality that African people are the mother and father of the rest of the human beings. Mm -hmm. And the only people, like, you know, most people have abandoned church. Most people have abandoned poetry. Most people have abandoned, you know, pre-modern wisdom traditions and things like that. And the one thing that reminds people of the world of meaning at all, like the only people that have permission and the platform to dig into the world of the unseen are the cultural leaders. You know what I'm saying? Like the the musicians and the and and fashion and dance and art, and the way that you were able to pull all of those things together, man, is amazing. Because my framework for everything is 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 Black Islam because that's mm. that's where I where like me and the world and like what can be done in the world meet. And you think about like the Nation of Islam was amazing because it had Malcolm, mm -hmm. and Malcolm is a hero based on his ability to articulate a message, to speak. To capture, you know, and to to be the spokesperson, and and and, and, and mm. drive to all those cities. 
<laughs> See, they, you know, just like they have motorcycle drive, motorcycle, motorcycle diaries about Che Guevara going to South America. Somebody need to make, you know, Oldsmobile diaries when Malcolm in the fifties. I wonder how many miles did he go when he drove. I mean, well, that's that, a story. That car itself. is at that car. His car is at Malcolm X College. Oh, really? In Chicago. Okay, one of yeah, his cars. It's yeah. there. Wow. Yeah, one of his cars. Yeah, man. The amount of miles that that Malcolm did is underplayed. The amount of road work he did, because I mean, I mean, he's got to go. And you drive yourself a lot too. Yeah, no question. And it's not that I'm a control freak. It's just that. The car is a pen and the road is my pad, that type of thing. That's what that's where that inspiration comes from. You know. You know. I, I, know I can't you, explain uh, any other any other kind of way, but the road kind of really gives me like this this thing. It it gives you it gives you a rising. Hmm. It gives you although you could be on a road that you've been on before. But it's still the unpredictability in it because you don't know really what's ahead in the traffic of that particular day. You might know the road, but you don't know what's in the road, you know. Yeah. And um, some of us before GPS, <laughs> you know, really seriously would take on a road with all of your senses intact. But we're, we're entering the time, Ali, as you well know, that where um, the senses are being reduced and artificial intelligence is not going to get any dumber at all. It's only going to mm -hmm. get pow powerful and smarter. And therefore, each mm -hmm. one of our senses are uh, atrophied and a, a lot of them are going to be the really so much like underused that you're going to be asking a computer to give you soul. It's already there. Um, mm -hmm. GPS is great to use, but once again, it's the struggle of, I got to use my brain before I use the GPS, as mm -hmm. opposed, I got to rely on the GPS to get me to where I got to get to. And we're in that time right now where people won't, they won't even go 10 blocks without the GPS and I, right. that, and I'm talking about, you know, like not, not just like 14, 15 year old people. I'm talking about like people in their thirties and forties, like, yo, yes, sir. I can't get nowhere. And, and not everybody has a, doesn't have to be a Gunga den, you know, <laughs> just gotta be like, Oh man, I know the road, you know, everywhere. But, but damn, you know, it, it's a sign. And so many signs mm -hmm. of the battle between human beings and machines is happening. Mm -hmm. It's so evident right now. I mean, that's what the matrix was talking about. It's like, Machines replacing human beings and human beings replacing machinery. And yeah. that's the battle, you know, that, that, that goes on between the two. But understand, <laughs> the universe creates no straight lines. been really happy and honored to talk for the past several weeks on a podcast about Zakat Foundation, specifically their program to support orphans. Zakat Foundation, I'm actually wearing their, their t-shirt. Zakat Foundation is a global charitable organization, humanitarian organization. And specifically, we're partnering and I'm really happy, excited and grateful and honored really to be sharing with you about their program and project to relieve and support orphans around the world. Uh, some of the most important elements of this project are that when you donate to the program, none of that money goes to admin costs, none of it pays for people's salaries, none of it goes to marketing. 100% of your donation for orphan relief goes directly to youth and their families. Also, they have quality control people on the ground in the locations to make sure that the goods and resources are delivered to the people that need them most in a way that's dignified, in a way that's human, in a way that's, that's um, beautiful, you know, and that's oftentimes not the case. Uh, part of what's so dope about this program is that my sister, my friend Amna Mirza, this is really a pet project for her. It's like, a, it's like her baby, she calls it. Um, one of the things that they do in orphan relief oftentimes, historically, is that they show you pictures of different orphans and they let you choose. 
And it's really beautiful because it, you see those pictures of those, of those children and you're like, oh, this kid doesn't have food. I want to help him. So that's very beautiful. But what she discovered was happening is that, you know, people were choosing if they saw these different photos, probably without realizing it, they were choosing younger, lighter skin girls and older youth, um, you know, more mature youth who, who are, you know, black and darker skin boys, especially they weren't getting chosen. And so rather than show you pictures, when you go to their site, you'll see it. There are two different settings that you can choose. One is I want my donor, I want to sponsor the orphan that's most in need, who's been on the waiting list longest, who has who's in the in the most need. The other that you can choose is that if you want to, you can uh, support an orphan in a specific region. So Somalia, Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, Syria, uh, Palestine. You can do that. But most people, when when presented with that choice. Do I want to support the people that are in most need? Most of them choose that. So it's a super dope thing. And since they've made that change, they've started to see things become more equitable. And, and youth that have been on the waiting list for a long time now are being served and now they're getting you know, proper food and shelter and medical care and education and counseling and resources, not only for them, but for, the, for their families. Zakat Foundation, also another important thing to know is that it's a Muslim-led humanitarian humanitarian, you know, global humanitarian organization, but they don't only help Muslims and they don't proselytize. Those are some of the other kind of, kind of, um, I would call them pitfalls that you see in some other organizations and, and, and charity programs. So Zakat Foundation also, they don't limit the idea of an orphan or the category of orphan to people who both of their, of their parents are, have passed away. So if one of your parents dies and the other one isn't able to support you, then they're considered orphans and they're given help and support. Zakat Foundation, it operates in, I think it's 14 or 15 countries. They're looking to support 10,000 orphans this year. Uh, the donation rate is fifty dollars. Um, I'm telling you that as much as we can possibly trust an organization like this, a program like this, I trust the Cop Foundation, and I'm happy for them to be partners and sponsors on the Travelers Podcast. It's a really personal thing to me that we're partnering on the Travelers Podcast with Roots Community Birth Center because I have four children. And my wife and I uh, delivered and welcomed our youngest baby to the world at Roots Community Birth Center in North Minneapolis. It's one of a small handful nationally of community birth centers that are owned and operated by a black woman, by black women. So shout out to my dear sister, Rebecca, and her team. You know, we had a variety of experiences with our first three children. Um, you know, I was blessed to be there. I was blessed to deliver them and be part of the process. Uh, Roots Community Birth Center being in the community and then also being run by people who and presented and facilitated and operated by people who share my wife's experience culturally um, is, an ex is, is a benefit and a treasure and a gift beyond words, really. You could just feel from the moment you call them on the phone. You can feel it from the moment that you you know drive into the parking lot. They're right there in North Minneapolis, which is a historically black neighborhood, which is where I lived as a teenager. And you know to go in there the way that you're welcomed, it feels like you're at home, which is the way that it should feel. You know, God bless these hospitals and and you know what they what they do, and when they're able to help people, it's a wonderful thing. But the reality is that this is a situation that was set up by men and it was set up by white men. And all of the, the just human shortcomings, you know, that human beings have um, show up in the sense that, you know, these are, are spaces that were not created by the people who utilize them and by they, the people that they serve. And so Roots Community Birth Center is profoundly beautiful. Uh, we're happy to partner with them because we encourage you to hit up their website to go and check them out and to support and to spread the word. Uh, this is something that really, you know, we're hoping it becomes normalized in our culture. You know, uh, Roots is owned and operated by black women, but they don't only serve black women. And it's not only black women that work there, but it really matters to have people from the community who have a shared cultural experience, who have a, a, a shared 
uh, language, a shared way of communicating, are able to respond to each other's bodies. We're talking about a very physical reality here that's also mental, that's also cultural, that's also spiritual. And you know, the, the experience that we had there was really profoundly beautiful. So we're very grateful to partner with and to, to wave the flag and blow the horn and sound the alarm and ring the bell for Roots Community Birth Center. One of the things that's been so important to me and that I've been so grateful for in the 20 year career that I've had of making music and now stepping into podcasting and other things that we offer at Travelers Media is that I've been independent. And what that means is that the music and the podcasting and all of the things that we do, they're not backed by major corporations or by investors whose sole purpose in investing is to get a financial return on their financial investment. This is the way that most media is produced. And so what that means is that the things that oftentimes resonate with me, that in my soul, in my heart, with my community, I need to talk about, the things that I need to express. Also, when I think about what do I want to put into your uh, uh, mental and spiritual diet, that you're giving your time and your energy and you're opening your ears to us and your hearts to what we do. What do we want to offer you? I don't want those things to be, ever be di dictated by what's going to be profitable. None of the things that I've done that have actually resonated with people would have seemed like good ideas financially when we did them. They all were risks. And the ability to take a risk on what matters to me is real freedom. And that's the reason that I do what I do. It's the reason you know that we pour our heart out into music and then we're over here in the podcast talking to... Cornell West and Ilhan Omar and the great Chuck D and the other uh, guests that we have coming up. So also the beautiful thing about being independent is that we're supported by people who in turn become a community and a caravan of people that know each other and connect with each other based on the fact that they're drawn to this unpopular music with unpopular messages. The people that connect based on this music, I've seen amazing things happen. People that met at our shows 20 years ago and got married and now they have children and their children come to the shows. 16 year old kid at a show, my parents met at a Brother Ali concert. Amazing, what? That's an incredible gift, you know. I, if, let me move on so I don't start crying. <laughs> but that, that dual thing of pe bringing people together and then them coming together is what allows this to be sustainable for us. We used to rely on touring to do that and live shows to do that. And it looks like that may come back, you know, but is it going to be the same way as before? It's hard to tell. It's hard to gauge. I'm on a tour now, but we'll see. But what this pandemic has taught us and, and, is, is that we really need to explore other ways and using these platforms as a means to encourage and foster connection. So if you go to brotherali.com, go to the join section, we have something called a caravan, which is similar to Patreon, but it's a little bit different, a little bit more suited to our specific needs and desires. And so if you go to that platform, you'll see that there's different tiers where people can join and subscribe and support what we're doing. The, the beginning tier gets you these episodes early without these long ad breaks of me talking. Uh, the second tier, there's other, you know, that you get a, um, a, a oral history of my first album and the beginning of my career. You also get uh, digital gift boxes throughout the year. And then we also do an Ask Me Anything section where I become the guest on the podcast and you become the interviewer and the host on the podcast by asking me. And so we have these monthly sessions where people ask me questions. And then the third tier is, a, is something of a financial investment. Um, but it also opens up all of those things of the previous ones, but also gives access to a private Slack channel where we communicate. And there's a community, a caravan of people growing in that Slack channel that it's a very, very beautiful thing. People from different walks of life, men and women, people of different ages, people of different backgrounds, people that live in different countries, sharing their experiences and connecting. Uh, you also get a free shirt when you sign up for that one, uh, the, the podcast shirt in a colorway that we don't offer anywhere else. So head to brotherali.com slash join, join the caravan, support this movement and become part of the community. 
You know, it's interesting, but I, I think about Malcolm being this amazing spokesperson, but he wasn't the organizer. That was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that organized the people that gave them the courage and that gave them the vision and like really helped cur- curate that. And then we think about the reason that we have those iconic images is because of um, Gordon Parks. Mm-hmm. That Gordon Parks had the the wherewithal and the foresight and the insight and the ability to capture it and to document it. Right, technology. You know what I mean? So we have this. Um, so you got we technology. have this movement because of these different people, right? But you did all of those things in the movement that was and and remains public enemy. No, I don't. Th- that you're the I, spokesperson. I don't, I don't take the you. I don't. I don't. I don't say I. I think we did because mm. we had a lot of people on a bunch of different vantage points. We encouraged Harry Allen to go in the media yes. before that yeah. we encouraged harry allen to to be harry allen was a photographer before he uh. actually became media assassin we went to school together he, he used to be called harry harry o vicious video he wasn't making no videos yet but i first met harry he was a fan of my artwork because i was a school cartoonist at adelphi he saw my mm. artwork he thought i was a white dude and then when he saw me, he was like, you're culture right now? I said, yeah. But you do like the cartooning for the Delphi. I said, yeah, that's me. I said, wow, wow. And it says, you're also part of Spectrum? Wow. So he was like mind blown, like, wow, you're, you're Chucky e. D, right? I was like, yeah. So we hooked up an animation class and we did a, mm. in 80, 1983, we did a animated video with my drawing and his putting together of world famous supreme teams looking like a ho- looking looking like a hobo which mm. was like dun, t- dun, t- you know and, it, and we did a hip hop animated video in 83 i don't know what he did with it but all i know i just was, i was this was recently at my at my alma mater and um and on my art show i had uh the, the near death experience has got a nice portrait of you up in there too Dude, that's that is one of the. I mean, just knowing you and having you as my teacher and my big brother and my friend is is one of the great honors of my life. But when I, yeah, man. <laughs> so who are the like? Can you tell me? Can you tell me about that series of those those portraits that you drew? It's one of well, it's one of like five thousand pieces of work I've done. I, I think mm-hmm. I've really channeled um, a lot of my art. And, and I ch- challenged a lot of my inner being into another place after the transitioning of my dad, my father. And yeah. it really was uh, yeah. going back into 30 years where I was prior to having me express everything through my art side itself. And um, yeah. so it's been all art all the time, thousands and thousands of works. And that happened to be a particular time where I was actually doing a certain level of portrait, but not for long. And I just wanted to, to just call it most of my heroes don't appear in those stamps. And um uh, and I came up with a with a series and out of all the thousands, um, you know, management and my team just said, Wow, we could go here and we could actually, you know, blow these up and and this could be a series in itself. And then they got together with Adelphi University and said, well, this is where we'll have to jump off point. So Chuck D and the near-death experience is a combination of where I'm going to rock you maybe a lecture, the rock in the walls, and maybe, you know, if the mic is open, let's go. You know what I'm saying? So it's a mm. different experience, man. Make, make, make different experiences for people who want to be able to put limiters on hip-hop and truncate hip-hop into what they think the the social definition of it is yes yeah and you've been a a curator and an advocate from from the beginning especially on wbau Mm -hmm. you know you you did you were the first one to interview you and hank and flavor were the first ones to interview run dmc mr bill first ones to interview stephanie uh, ll and bill stephanie and so and then when they would travel around the world and and they would collect on on tour they would bring back tapes and you would play things from around the world you're one of the first people to acknowledge that hip-hop is a global phenomenon Mm -hmm. you know i'm saying you uh, uh, begin your the album you know begin takes a nation of millions with you know that that, you know london england Uh you've been warned consider yourself warned you know and and 
initially I, I heard you say once that when Rick Rubin was trying to convince you to start making records, it's like, why would I make records? I am an advocate and a and a and a curator of this mm -hmm. culture. And if I don't if I don't get into making records, then I can keep continue to do this. And I think that you have. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that that I've is um, that you always have been ahead of using whatever the the technology is at the time although it seems to really come back to yeah. radio even like you know the 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 current version of of public enemy you call public enemy mm -hmm. radio when uh griff and flavor aren't mm -hmm. there but to to use the 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 technology of the time to really build and to maintain and to insist upon community on cultural continuity you know to uh, to to really insist on the community always being at the forefront and you know i just and, and and from that time you also were able to to critique radio yeah. like so much of, of 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 what you've said throughout the years is like you know why isn't the radio playing i remember you came in the the event that we met each other at you know we were there with the current and you were saying this is good because you all are some of the only ones that are playing you know atmosphere and brother ali and i self divine and you know Loved it. the people from this area yeah. yeah yeah and the thing is i would, I would come into the Twin Cities, and for the longest period of time, the Twin Cities would just have that, you know, uh, NOV way, way in the uh, the AM stations playing the black music. When the music is exploding out of the Twin Cities with yourself, rhyme says, atmosphere, slug, Prince. I mean, boom, boom, I'm like, how could major? We just had Stokely from yeah, the condition on the yeah, other day. How could this? How could this city, two, two cities, this whole region, not have it come across on the airwaves? I used to always just scratch my head like, wow, man. You know, of course, they begrudgingly like, okay, Prince. and But it took like two or three years for Prince to get, you know, played in Minneapolis on a regular. You know, so that was strange. You know, and even... Even the 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 public station that we have, like I said, we just had Stokely on, and I mean, you know, that's a that's a public radio station that plays a lot of our music, but the white stations in the Twin Cities they completely front on mint condition, yeah. and you got one of the greatest, and you know, and Stokely's father is the leading black intellectual and historian in the Twin Cities as well, professor, and. I mean, the, the, literally, you know, I'm talking about First Avenue. I'm talking about the, the you know, the, the newspapers that act like Mint Condition doesn't even exist. No. Mint Condition go to the, the Bay Area or go to D.C. and sell out arenas. And Stokely on his own, same thing. Changed the world. You know, I mean, so that, it's whole, still, that, it's still that whole amazing. region yeah. changed the whole world. And, um, and, 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 okay, so fast forward to the WWW, World Wide Web internet <laughs> cyberspace mm -hmm. or right. what mark zuckerberg yeah. is just trying to coin it like pat riley's three peat calling it the metaverse what does that mean the metaverse <laughs> means that mm -hmm. that that there's an investment in the real estate of your mind into these areas of galaxies and the universe and bubbles that that will exist in your thought pattern as they mind paper your your existence so now somebody in Fargo could probably get the, the same vibe of somebody in the Twin Cities, the same, the same vibe of somebody possibly in, in Istanbul. But the, the problem is it's curation and, it's, and everything is scattered. Mm -hmm. So what has to take place right mm -hmm. now is somebody is able to come. That's why you see the, the, the growth of podcasts. And people have seen this growth and don't even recall or never knew that podcast comes from iPod. <laughs> but I mean, we got another layer of generations that have never had an iPod either. So podcasts are basically right. curations, curators that go and snatch all the content, data, music, art out there, and they're able to have a concise conversation about it. But basically, that's replaced the 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 laziness and the lackadaisical, you know, mentality of what radio is supposed to be. Because if radio really was what radio was, it's, it's, a, it's a theater of the mind, but also it's the curator of music and entertainment. We're talking about audio, but we're in an age right now, Ali, and you recognize this as a, a great hearing person. You you compensate with your ears and your soul for for all mm -hmm. for maybe the lack of clarity that your eyes can't see. So you're always third eye in it anyway. 
But we're in a time where people listen a little bit too much because they listen with their eyes, which means they could be easily fooled. They don't yeah. listen with their ears. And at, the ears will atrophy yeah. because the ears are also the portal into the mind. But if you can like throw ro roadblocks up in there, not roadblocks, which is another problem, <laughs> roadblocks <laughs> or roadblocks right 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 <laughs> you can you you mm -hmm. you can really stop that 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 traffic between your ears and your mind with throwing a bunch of things that mm -hmm. people see and people are moving their eyes and so you mm -hmm. know they're not you know really the, the, the description for people between um 10 and 70 with these gadgets that they they call screen agers screen yeah. agers yeah screen agers they so, they 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 they're stuck to the screen and they're convinced by what they mm -hmm. see. And as we go further and mm -hmm. further into, into this decade, <laughs> what you see is really going to be not what it is. Matter of fact, what you yeah. see is going to be the opposite of what you see. You know, what you see is right. fire is going to be ice. What you see is rain is going to be, you know, desert. I mean, but as long as you see it, it's going to compute as that's what I saw and that's how the masses you know, and how the masses, they just call the masses them asses, and it's going to just move accordingly to that. So you got to have your third eye pumping and yeah. going. And and, and that's got to come from other receptacles like language, what you hear, what you feel, you know? You know, you can't mm -hmm. have, you, have, you don't have a lot of feelings if you have a soul of a robot. So your know, soul of a gadget yeah. is what this decade is aspiring to. How can we get you on the 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 beat of a soul of a gadget? Mm -hmm. You know, and 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 in this time, like art is is reduced and repackaged and repurposed and almost inverted into content. Like the difference between art and content is is really deep, and we're just, we're talking about the depth, and we're talking about the meaning, and we're talking about the soul, and we're talking about the humanity of it that's in art, that's not necessarily in content. And when you talk about yeah. connection versus attention, you yeah. know, you were saying earlier about the fact that everything is just attention. You know, just today, I, we we I just had a really dope conversation with Congresswoman Ilhan Omar that we posted today. Mm. Oh wow! And. And, you know, and I, we just love her, man. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, you know, I'm really good friends with Keith Ellison. And, like, I've okay. had friends that are, that are, Those are good you know, people. Oh, I love Keith, man. You know, he's one of the most, one of the most sincere, authentic, genuine, true public servants I've ever known. Mm -hmm. And he just happens to be, you know, a, a congressman who became the attorney general. So we post this joint with, with Ilhan Omar. Before going into it, I read her autobiography, and I talked to people that know her, and we are in the same community and things. And we had this beautiful conversation about connecting with people on a human level. She witnessed the Civil War in her, in, her, in her country when she was a little girl. And so she's talking about trying to speak truth while still acknowledging the humanity of the people that she disagrees with. Beautiful mm, conversation. Right. So I, post the, I just post her picture and just says, honored to welcome Ilhan Omar. And immediately, I mean, my fans don't hate on me because I'm not famous. It's like if you right. if you follow me, it's because you know what you're getting. Man, the 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 I started all these messages. She's this, she's that, horrible stuff. And I said, man, I don't want my comment section to be a place where people argue. But I know that that drives traffic. So I start deleting those comments, hiding those comments, mm -hmm. just because I'm like, no, we're not doing that. We're not, we're not arguing about whether or not Ilhan Omar is a human being. Right. And immediately when I did that, because just posting the picture, the, the post took off. And then I, you know, I, I basically removed everything that would allow for people to argue. And it's almost like the robots, the algorithm, whatever you call it, immediately realized that. And they just stopped showing it to people. Like it just stops circulating. You know what I mean? Like the 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 views and the exposure and the reach. They talk about right. reach, you know. And it just really highlights what you were saying about attention. Like just it doesn't matter if it's connection, doesn't matter if it's humanizing, right. doesn't matter if it's healing, doesn't right. matter if it's, you know, just we we don't care about light, we just need heat. We just need right. energy. You but, know, but, the, but the, the key, just, the key just is feed, feed the machine. But the key, but the key is that you overstand all these things and and you rise above it and just be you and continue continue to deliver. One of the, the one of the um, the aspects of the machine, the the, the obvious aspects of of the, um, the machine is how we quantitate everything. 
right. instead of the quality yes, of things. Quality. We, That's we, it. we had yes, to come sir. up with the people are concerned about the quantity of things. And once right. you remove yourself away from the thought of counting anything, if anything yes, you count, you count Especially your Especially a human being. Yeah, yeah, man. Especially you, you, know, you count human beings. That's slave right. master business, man. Right, right. You count that's your blessings. Captor, that's that's captor you, business. That's, right. The only thing you should count, you count your blessings. Yeah. But then you count your blessings, and then you got to do something with your blessings. Right? Knowledge is power, but it ain't. And the other day, mm -hmm. somebody was asking me, like, well, Chuck, matter of fact, on national TV, they said, oh, Chuck, do you meditate? I said, no, I I delve into the art. So, auditation mm -hmm. is, is, is what I do. It's auditation. Mm -hmm. Uh, when I'm doing some graphic, because you know, art, art is is short for artificial. It's real, but it ain't. It's a facsimile of our lives. Mm -hmm. Can galvanize it, but it's not really always supposed to be tangible. It's it's mm -hmm. supposed to be felt a lot more than than it is held or grasped or owned. You know, it's mm -hmm. like it's it's mm -hmm. it's liquid, man. It's it's blood flow in in, the, in our whole. You know, life circle of this yes, particular sir. realm that we know that that we're, that we're allowed to know, and you know, my and if we don't my, know, my primary religious teacher, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah, says that beauty is the splendor of truth. So beauty, art, uh, you know, beautiful speech, beautiful painting, beautiful beats, beautiful rhymes. That they're the, the they're basically the 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 world of meaning, the world of truth entering into the world of meaning in a way that we can see. But it really that isn't the truth itself. It's pointing to the truth. It's a reminder right. of the truth. Exactly. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. yeah. It's a sign, and that's the the thing that's so so beautiful about music, particularly in the the world of American Empire, where that has so many lies about who's human and who's not. That the the people that have been in the material sense, every every single uh, 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 technology and every single uh, you know area and aspect of power was used to remove the knowledge of you know uh, language, culture, family, uh, property, rights, folkways, mores, religion, culture, God, knowledge of tribe, all of this stuff, and for those very people to be the ones that have this outpouring, this like endless ocean of meaning that the whole world uses to remind. Of, of the of the reality of truth and of beauty yeah it's the, really the beauty, evidence of that or, or the beauty of of, of human beings mm -hmm. is that you should have the audacity and the right to challenge what is thrown at you as truth it's all right to mm -hmm. disagree you know the mm -hmm. proof comes out in and and to into the works that that really makes you say well damn that's the undeniable truth so mm -hmm. to someone that, that this now you if you disagree vehemently and disrespectfully, you know right. then that's that's something else. But somebody says, well, yes, you sir. know, I have to in my realm, I have to be convinced of this belief. So all right, while you're trying to be convinced of whether this is truth or real or whatever, just try not to step on nobody else's beliefs on your way there, you know. And, you know, and, and that, we. we yeah. I'm sorry, when you talk about um, disagreeing in, you know, in a beautiful way, um, you're somebody that, you know, you said uh, old enough to raise you. So like when mm -hmm. you came out, I think these guys are 20 mm -hmm. and you're 26. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in like 20 year old years, that's a full generation. It used you know to what be, saying? yeah. Like when, yeah. I, when, I, when I met, you know, Slug and Ant and Sadiq from Rhyme Series, I was 19 and they were 25, 26, oh, 27. Oh, 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 it's man, like, so man. I... I got dad issues with these guys, man, and they're only a few years older than me. But to this day, they're like they're my dads. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. And um, you know, you're somebody that always mentorship, and I know it comes from your dad. You know, uh, may he rest in peace. You know, what I'm saying Lorenzo Douglas Rittenauer. But, but you and I, I definitely want to talk about. But what I want to ask you though, brother, is you've always spoken. Um, to certain realities very lovingly and critique to critique people sometimes even by name within the culture i remember you saying that salt and pepper you're like i love them they're my sisters but you don't have to do twist and shout we don't do pop music we don't mm -hmm. go to them they come mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. um you know you 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 you, you know check uh, biggie for for using the ten you know making the 10 crack commandments with your voice like no you don't use me to teach people how to sell crack not my voice you know, um, you made a di you made a diss song about Kanye and Jay Z in 2011. I you did? know, Watch the Throne. Oh yeah, yeah, and yeah. Then, well, I didn't then, think it was disrespectful. 20... I thought they were being disrespectful by yes, just sitting on a 
throne, you know, and everybody else. When the people just, are starving. Yeah. Well, well, I just thought that, you know, like, come on, man, it, this, there's a, there's a ocean full, this is an ocean full of MCs. Mm -hmm. Right. In order to claim a throne, man, you better be like you better you better go in the ring and 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 and, and, and it's body time. Right. I, you often I be bringing up this dude, man, because people seem to forget. I think one of the I, and I don't know everybody has a different opinion, but from up your way, when idea was out, um. yo, when I saw this kid, man, I said now this kid here. I ain't never seen the dude picking off in a battle. He picking off other dudes' bars like an interception and running in the end zone. Yeah. I so when people start claiming that they're the best, you better pick that category that you're the best in and just hold it right there. Because when you say you the you the, we, you the king of the throne, you king of the the mm. number one MC and stuff like that, man, there's an yeah. ocean full of yeah. MCs. I've seen Ben said the same thing. Uh, yeah, he went on uh, Hot ninety seven, and he said, Hot, "Rakim is alive and well." You know, y'all see that, that boy. You, Slick bro, Rick is alive and bro, very well. I won't even go there, man. <laughs> There's been MCs in New York City, man, since nineteen seventy six, bro. Mm, 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 I mm, watched mm. my step when I came in, man. I said, "I, I understand." It's been a decade of MCs before my first record. So I got to be able to figure out where's my niche I could come into. I said, the only thing I could, I know that I could probably get away with is saying, I'm going to be the loudest MC that y'all ever heard. And that just right. comes to come with, you know, certain attributes. I want to become a sportscaster and, and yes, back sir. to my pops. It's like, I, yeah. when I was growing up, it was Dr. Martin Luther King who was living that was heard in the house on different with radio or records or whatever. But my dad was like neck to neck with that. I always thought Dr. Martin Luther King was my dad because my dad is yelling. If he's yelling in the house, the walls is like this, yo. I'm serious, yeah. man. My brother would tell you, my brother would be like, Erica, go, go to the other side of the town to the park. You know, Roosevelt's one square mile. My father be like, yo, where's Eric? Because I'll be raking the yard, right? My brother cut out and leave like me with the rest of the yard to get with his boys, right? So my pops would be like, you let him just up and leave? I said, I just was raking back there. Well, you shouldn't have let him go. And so where is he at? I said, he went down to the park. My dad would go to the stoop and yo, Eric, and yo, really seriously? Everybody, he could not come back and say, my dad say, like, didn't you hear me call you? He could not lie, bro. Yo, Ali, he could not lie because everybody heard him. So my brother <laughs> said, you know, I'll just take the punishment, man. But yeah, I heard you. <laughs> so I, so that came from that. And so, you know, like. And your dad was a mentor for young men and, and an advocate for young uh, men um, and, and taught, taught young men how to be. But let me, let me put it to you this way, Ali. In our neighborhood, that neck of the woods with Harlemites moved out to Long Island. All it was that was just that was the everyday, you know, black father suit. It was like the fathers damn near outnumbered the, the boys. Well, we would play baseball back when baseball was a game, everybody came together. And I swear, you know, fathers is lined up like, you know, there's arguments, there's they're the umpires, they the coaches and all that. All oh, you couldn't really make a, a move. So my dad was one of those people who said, oh, yeah, yeah. At that time, in the 60s and 70s, not only were, were we in that role, but we wanted the role. They, that was the key thing, my mm -hmm. dad says. He said, you know what? We wanted the role. So that was, that was uh, you know, I'll never forget what my dad told me that. He says, yeah. He said, yeah, well, you know, we, but we wanted that role. So to want mm -hmm. that role it puts that extra yeah. little thing on it, you know? So I got that. If you're a regular here on the Travelers Podcast, you know that 
I'm really excited and honored to be joined as a sponsor and partner by Vice Gerent, makers and manufacturing of fine men's tailored clothing. You know, we talk about the fact that you got to eat. And if you are not, if you and I are not intentional about what we eat, then what we eat will probably not be healthy. It probably won't be the specific nutrition that we need. Uh, it probably won't be sourced in a way that's ethical. Um, you know, if we go for the cheapest and easiest options, there's probably going to be a lot about that, that decision and that purchase and what we put in our bodies that we're not going to feel good about. Well, the same is true for what we put on our bodies. Um, you know, the, the reality is that most of the clothes that we buy are sourced in ways that are unethical. A lot of times they're not sustainable. A lot of times they're made in sweat factory type conditions that are not far from slavery. Um, most of the time when we buy things, the, the markup is tremendous. The amount of money they actually spend making those clothes is minimal. Um, but the markup is great. And so you're paying for the logo, you're paying for the advertising and the marketing, and you're paying the corporate interest of the people that manufacture these clothes and produce the, these garments. And then we wear them in the world, you know, and they're not made for us. And, you know, the intention that went into and the energy and the experience of the people that went into making the clothes, it absolutely affects and impacts the clothes that we wear. And so... Having clothes tailored, especially by Vice Darrant, by my friend, my brother, I've known him for years now, Usman the Tailor in Chicago. Usman is a really amazing man. He comes, his, his family's from Pakistan. Um, and, you know, because of the fact that he deals with clothes all the time, if you go to Vice Darrant Official and check out their social media, you'll see that he dresses amazingly all the time. But he makes each individual uh, suit or garment or you know, each individual piece for the person that he's working with. So he starts by sitting with you and talking with you about how do you want to show up? What's your energy? What, what's your intention? What's the work that you do? And, and why do you do it? And then crafts pieces for your body. You know, so many of us have issues with the way that our body looks. And a lot of us, I, I realized this for myself for years and years. It wasn't until I moved to another country that I realized like there was a part of me that was in some kind of way waiting for my body to become acceptable so that I could really be myself completely. And one of the beautiful things about going to a tailor is that the tailor says, you know, we're not going to try to fit your body into clothes that are made for some standard size or some standard shape. Your body is what your body is. And so we're going to we're going to craft these garments to fit you and to accentuate and highlight the best parts of you, the things of you that the parts of you that you feel good about. And so you know, they're crafted that way. The, the materials are sourced in ways that are sustainable. And then you know that what you're paying for is not a brand. It's not a corporation. It's not somebody's logo or somebody's marketing budget. What you're paying it for is human beings to make clothes and craft clothes specifically for the fact that you're going to live in them. And it's just a really, really very beautiful experience. And I couldn't recommend it more highly. Um, you know, most people will say, well, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be a diva. I'm not trying to be a narcissist and all this kind of stuff. But the reality is that being intentional about the clothes that we wear is much more than just about our own vision of ourselves. But along with that, there's, it's an important thing for us to understand that we do have an inherent dignity. And the, the way that we uh, treat ourselves and the way that we present ourselves and the way that we clothe ourselves when we step out into the world, it says something and it also has an impact on the way that we show up and the way that we work, the way that we affect and impact the people in the world around us. So head to Vice Jarrett, uh, check out their social media, check out their website, make an appointment with Usman the Taylor. It, uh, several people that listen to the podcast have traveled to Chicago already uh, to sit with Usman the Taylor. I'm telling you, I couldn't recommend this more highly. It's been an amazing impact and reality in my own personal life. And so happy to partner with Vice Jarrett. We're honored to be in partnership with UPF, Unity Productions Foundation. Unity Productions is a group of, uh, of artists and creatives that come to together to do really beautiful productions, but also to do good work in the world via creativity. Uh, specifically, we work with them on a project called Un Unfold Your Own Myth, 
which brings together specifically writers like myself, poets, songwriters, authors, uh, musicians, uh, people that explore and express themselves to create an online uh, learning series that teaches young people how to do exactly that. And it's extremely important, especially for people who are in situations in the world where the dominant culture deems them to be unimportant and uninteresting, these stories that we don't hear. And by teaching them to explore themselves, express themselves, to document their stories, to tell their stories, to imagine, you know, uh, to, to create, you know, works of fiction as well. This is a deeply humanizing thing that, first of all, really reinforces the fact that there's an entire universe going on inside you. You're not just the situation that you're in, you know, but also there are people that need to learn from the wisdom you've gleaned from the life that you've lived. Your life matters to people and what you've learned from your life matters to people. So what you've learned and also what you imagine and, and the things that you you know, create. It's very important. And so if you're in community, uh, if you bring youth together, uh, if you are a teacher, head to upf.tv slash unfold, upf.tv slash unfold. And you can bring this seminar to the youth that you work with, to the people, the community that you serve. And just very, very grateful to be in partnership with UPF. And so, and then you ended up mentoring so many. I mean, there's been times that I called, I remember I called you one time I was in Europe and I'm about to go on stage and it was, in, I was in France and uh, Zidane, the North African football player had just headbutted the, the dude in the, in, the, in the World Cup and he was Muslim and they, on the side of the stage, you couldn't see it from the audience, but on the side of the stage, they had taken black trash bags and made an effigy of this man and they put his jersey on him and they had him hanging from a noose. And I'm sitting there with, you know, the, the, my crew, um, these guys, and like I'm responsible for them being away from their families and they got to get paid. And so I'm like, I'm not, I, I'm not performing with that up there. And they're like, oh, you don't understand and da, 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 da. And I called you and I was like, what do I do? You know what I mean? Like, I, like we came all this way. I'm performing at this big festival. It was a big paycheck too. And I'm like, everybody's expecting to get paid. You know what I mean? And you told me, you already know what to do and you don't even need me to tell you what to do. And I was like, all right. <laughs> so I went and told them, you know, I, I'm not performing. And they took it down, you know. But I know that you've been a mentor to so many people. You know, there was a, a young Muslim leader who passed away now, but he was this, you know, really, um, you know, verbose, you know, just grandiose, like just had this, this, you know, this really big spirit. And one time you called me and he was in my kitchen. I don't know if you remember this, but I handed him the phone. And I mean, if anybody that's ever heard him speak, I mean, you know, really just gravitas coming out his eyes. And I handed him the phone and I didn't tell him who it was. And I think he looked at it and it said, I think it said Carlton, uh, Carlton Douglas on it. Because uh, uh, all, my, all my rapper buddies, I put different names. So if someone <laughs> finds my phone, they won't, they won't just call Chuck D. So he goes, hello? And it was your voice. And he just goes, he looks at me and he says, thank you for raising us, sir. <laughs> And then he and then he put the phone down and went in the other room and he's like crying. He's um, like, I just talked to you. But I mean, you mentored Tupac and you mentored, you know, so many of our of our heroes, you know. Um, but, and I just but that, like that, I know that that comes from your dad. Well, well, I mean, yeah, but that's what you're supposed to do. It's like, I mean, mm. let, let's let's keep it rap, right? Let's keep it rap. Mm. I love rap, mm. right? It's not necessarily I'm gonna mm. go sit down and. And, uh, you know, and just going to just enjoy a night of Cecil Taylor. You know what I'm saying? So I, I at 61, want to sit or stand or whatever in an audience and enjoy Brother Ali, or enjoy Consequence or Substantial, even Kanye West or Jay-Z. I want to sit down mm -hmm. and I want to leave there like, yo, that was dope. Right? Right, right, right. But, right. you know, I, I, that's also come from sports, too. Sports is like mm. you you're not gonna you, you could reinvent the game, but you're not gonna invent the game. So mm. the best of the best get trained and taught by the best to be the best. So mm. when they go and compete and you sit down and watch the competition, you relish that. You're like, wow. 
that's the best I've ever seen because I enjoy watching the game. I absorb my team. And that person is phenomenal. And I enjoy watching it. So if you're a sports fan and you love the sports because of whatever varying reasons it is, it's going to come from, you know, it, it's going to come from that. Um, and and when and when you have critiqued people, they they it seems like they receive it with the love and the and the communal family kind of. I'm saying, w- when you had that joint with Jay Z, they put you on. I mean that that was 2011, and in 2013 he did his 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 Made in America festival, and he brought you on to to headline it. For years, has anybody not for, received it? For that years, way? for years they everybody's always trying to put me in front of somebody to put up a fight up on something they don't like. And I'm like, for years they've tried to put me, oh man, well, you know, what's Chuck got to say about Jay-Z? What do you got? I'm like, yo, I'm not saying nothing about nobody, man. I would mm. only say that, listen, serve your audience, don't diss your audience, and there's got to be somebody mm. to come behind you. I, I, don't, I don't like the division between a lot of artists today. I don't like the division between the generations of artists in the last two generations. They on a yes, financed sir. island by themselves with a whole bunch of business cash say around it. And to me, I, you know, I just don't think. I think it, it gets to a point where where it, it runs and, and dodges and, and ducks that when a Travis Scott gets in trouble. Everybody disappears and nobody speaking for Travis Scott or cause they kind of like lead them down a path and they keep following them. To, and, and when something happens, then all of a sudden, Oh yeah, see, I knew that was going to happen. It's like, wow, seriously. So wh- 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 mm. who's the dude that was around Travis Scott? Where did he come from? Who, who, who jump started this? And, and what I don't like, mm. I don't like the, the fact that nobody really seriously has a, a mental lineage that people like, all right, well, maybe maybe the last one, like Drake coming out of Lil Wayne and you know, Nicki Minaj, and you mm-hmm. see that the you know the the, the cash money, you kind of see that. Up. But after that, you know when you when you start seeing like the the heavy, you know, drifting off the the suicides, the Percocets, and all mm-hmm. that figured in, it's like wow, man, wow, that's just like. Well, well, where's where? You know, each one of these situations need coaches in there. Like ball players yes. will have an ex player that be a coach. You know, Michael Jordan owns the team. It's like, but if the stage is not important, and the real and the song is not important, and the only thing is important is the spoils, then you're in a whole mm. different dynamic, man. It's like it's not you know, man. It ain't even about the site. The sound, the story, or the style. It's about like, yo, man, it's like it's like we're gonna get the spoils. And yeah, I'm telling you, there's cats in the fifties say, Yeah, we did rock music so we could get a girl in the car. They'll tell you that. Mm-hmm. But let me tell you, mm-hmm. when they, they knew they had to hold some attention up there. Now we get into the area, is it good art versus bad art? You get into the semantics of Good art versus bad art. Art is art. It's based on the beholder and it's subjective. But sometimes it's not when you talk about the standard of things that require effort, work, and the ability to evolve upward, not devolve. Yes, sir. And devolving is like, well, I want to do it, but I ain't going to work how to do it. So, yeah, you ain't going to do it. But if that's going to be accepted, their lack of effort in it is going to turn into something else. And th- those are some of the mm-hmm. problem areas we might have with the rap game and the spit game. And hip hop and rap, it's like, this is like ball. Mm-hmm. The minute that somebody feels that they can get you, means that you better take it somewhere else higher. Right. Because if you don't separate yourself from the audience, why, why, would, they, why would they even check you? They got to check right. you for something else. I got to yeah. check out dude because they're going to pull some kind of spectacle. And there's mm-hmm. a line. You know what the line is between spectacle and spectacular. Spectacular mm. takes that effort that it's, it's like, yo, man, I don't know what he's doing. Back right. in the beginning of rap, 
Yes, the sir. fact that the dude was just rhyming and talking fast over a beat mode, people right. were like, wow, yo, <laughs> I don't even know what. It's got, but damn, 40 <laughs> years later, yeah, I mean, yeah. 40 years later, it's, it's evolved, it's evolution. But mm -hmm. still, it's got to evolve to different, you know, planes. And, and because it's art and it's innate and it deals with a whole bunch of semantics that people can't put their finger on, it's mm -hmm. got to go to a place where it grabs you. Not the incident, not the spectacle, the mm -hmm. spectacular. And the spectacular. <laughs> look, this is what, look, regardless of the fact, you know what? When a rapper felt like I, I've reached this, I, I've done all I can, right? You know what mm -hmm. I tell them? Mm -hmm. Spit in another language. Right. <laughs> what, what would they yeah. tell you? Spit in another language. Spit in four languages like they do in Brazil. Yeah. Or like they do in West Africa, where they spit in four yeah. and they braid it like hair. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, you got it all figured out? All right, why don't you get you and three other MCs and not just bar it you know, like, I'm going to come with my bars, they're going to come with their bars, and we're going to call ourselves, you know, we're going to watch the throw. No. Why don't you interplay and trade off? Mm -hmm. Why don't you, like, toss back and forth then? And mm -hmm. why don't you toss invisibly? Like, for example, that person's always in there. I, was, I saw you and Slug do it. Mm -hmm. I, I saw it actually maybe from routine into area of innovation. We, yeah, that, that, that night we were, we were going off the head doing that. that that's what I'm saying. So you, so what mm -hmm. you doing? You taught you, 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 you volley, volleying, you know, mm -hmm. we volleying freestyling. Okay. When the minute that you think and, and, and how now that's difficult, you mm -hmm. got to really, A, know that, know, know who you, who you're volleying with. B, right. you got to know your craft. Yeah. C, you got to know that the person that you crafting with, got equal or if not greater craft so you could craft yes, along sir. so the yes, audience sir. could be what so what what does that what does that leave the audience with a w e d s the audience must always be awestruck and they yes, must sir. be awestruck by the spectacular instead of the spectacle you could and come the process up with that spectacle. it takes yes and the way that the process that it takes to get to that point is something that like you don't do that just by the sexy moments of people clapping for you and cheering for you. There's a whole lot of learning your own shortcomings. There's a whole lot of learning your own like you have to really learn some very difficult things about yourself and then really sit with those things and build yourself and build your ability and really explore yourself, examine yourself so that you can express yourself. Like it really so, is a deep so spiritual education. Mm -hmm. Just so the onlooker could be like, I don't know what he did, but what WTF? Damn, yeah. what the? I don't even know what that. All I know was dope. Yeah, that's what the craft misses with missing sprockets here and there. Not comparing any era to anything. I'm just like yeah. saying evolution versus devolving into an area of laziness ineptitude and other things are, are a factor other than the grasp of the art form which captured mm -hmm. somebody's like whoa that's something wow i didn't think a person could do that wow that was entertaining you know 95 mm -hmm. percent of the world's going to look to be entertained while five percent be able to entertain you mm -hmm. 95 percent of the 95% of the players looking to fill their time up with something. Creative right. people could go to a concrete corner and come up <laughs> out of that corner with like a furnace. We create to, they're pregnant with ideas. They're pregnant right. with creativity. It's like, why right. are you so happy in that corner? And matter of fact, mm -hmm. it brings jealousy, envy. It brings oh a lot God. of those, those like, yo, man, I don't even know why you're so aloof. You're not even here with us. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, but you are here with us. Thing, man. But, yeah, right. but, but you are here with us. You, you know, you're mm. a beacon, you're a beacon, you're a furnace. Mm. You're a furnace of something in that corner. It's energy. I mean, people have reduced it to saying it's energy. But it's energy that, that, that and this is why people need entertainment. Entertainment is the energy of saying, I can use my time to enjoy in that energy to be able to, you know, we know we can't share time, but when we're on the same time to share and have a commonality, time is mm -hmm. beautiful to share, man.
Time is an yeah. unbelievable, beautiful gift to share. Because yeah. you, as you actually know with time, it is not guaranteed, bro. So when we yes, have sir. the time and we could share the time and we could actually sip the time instead of guzzle the time, because time is, you know, it's like that beat. Yeah. The time is not going to jump beats. It's going to be like this. It's going to be consistent. Then we could say, damn, that time was good. Mm. You know, some of the greatest memories that I have from being on the road are, you know, you and your family coming to the show and then saying, okay, tomorrow the whole the whole tour crew is coming to our place for breakfast. For breakfast and serving you know pancakes I mean? and pouring syrup on just, your immortal yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just like, you know, me and, and I self divine and Mortal Technique and Poison Pen and Chino XL and just, you got like all these big muscly dudes and, you know, the, the baby is running around and, yeah. you know, and man, we, you know, I've sat up in, in a couple of different houses of yours for just hours, man, for, for um, you know, just yeah, working man. it out and just talking it out. And what you told me the first time I met you, artists need artists. There are certain wow. things that... Your therapist can't tell you. Your imam can't tell you. Your wife can't tell you. Your parents can't bro. tell you. Artists need artists. Artists need artists, bro. Because you are a furnace. You are supernova creativity. You're, all, you're exploding when people are asleep. You're exploding when you're asleep. We use mm -hmm. these powers that we might have been you know bestowed upon us for a second or two and you gotta you gotta you gotta use it for the greatest uh, for the great greatness of good there's there's a role and responsibility for human beings on this planet just to be able to look over the behalf of the other species <laughs> i mean I, I look man marvin gay bob marley they did not approach making their music without mentioning the word love. Yes, sir. Philadelphia International, that's Gamble, Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff. They spent all their, their 1970s and love was the message, man. They did not go mm -hmm. through the 1970s without mentioning the word love. That's right. from 1970 yeah. to 1979. Ain't no stopping yes, us now to the, I think the, the first major hits they was having like, like you know, like OJ but before that, you know, Express Way to Your Heart. But the theme of it is like love. Even when they write the spinners songs, love. Sixties, right. Motown, Stacks, yeah. love is yeah. somewhere in there, even if we're being pinned down and we're not looked upon as being, you know, civil human beings, so we gotta fight for civil rights, but love is going to be in there somewhere man even yes. in the 80s and hip-hop man it's like you know what man yeah man we trying to get y'all to love us we all we cruise we all together man you know you know yeah love is somewhere in there 90s confrontational but at the same time we're going to make you love us we you know we get some love got love for you too and you know, Right, you know, spread so love, get love. Every, every decade, the, the the love starts spiraling down the drain. But you know, like the love is still there somewhere, and the love could be recognized. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that mm -hmm. rap music has always been, you know, it's been a music of love. I mean, it, it, at its best, at its best, it's a music of love. Even when you like going boom, 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 you know, it's confrontation and all that. But it ain't hate music, right? It, and you know, right. it, it's like. If it's hate music, you hate the fact that it ain't love music. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So I am. And when you love along. someone, you hate their suffering. Yeah, exactly. No, and you know, and so much of so much of what is in the music that I think sometimes people might not always hear is that even some of the music that that you know outwardly might seem negative in terms of the words on paper, right. it's like if you know what these guys could be doing, and if you know what their environment is telling them about themselves, right. and if you know about the the nightmares and catastrophes that they've suffered through, and the fact that they're channeling all of the pain and all of the heartache and all of the deprivation of love into music instead of whatever else they could be doing. And even 
there's a connection between people who have experienced that type of pain you, that, that they recognize that that vibration of like I understand that anger that right. you're on and there is a communal a communal thing that happens that does actually equate to a type of love yeah you know what I'm saying even in negative music even, even in there, hard rock you know like the the you know what I'm saying Wu-Tang Clan ain't nothing uh, uh, yep. you know what I'm saying yeah, it's of like course. There, there's a connection in the like yes I also had to weaponize and defend myself yes I, I recognize that that vibration you're on because i also didn't have a mother my mother was also in prison and my father was also you know on drugs and my, my you know so there's even a connection that happens in the most outwardly negative music that still ultimately takes a person back to love and connection that's what you need the curators and the curators make sure that yes sir. that you have all the balances and that's one of the mm -hmm. things that's why i attacked radio because i thought radio seriously left the music dead after mm -hmm. especially after the 80s they left the music they did not include rap music and hip-hop and when they finally let it mm -hmm. through the door it was already like you know damn you know it's muscling through the door because you had a chance to balance and nurture it in our communities in black mm -hmm. communities i felt that 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 there's 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 two there, there could be two vital components to balance out that love and i you know you might say i'm crazy but one is a, your, your public library and mm -hmm. and when the public library integrates everybody from the community we need more libraries and when the public library they had a chance to integrate people from the community at a high dosage at the turn of the digital revolution and mm -hmm you have to nurture in this incoming technology and understand that you won't want them to detach from the library of books. We, we talked about our difficulties just with the technology. Like try to bring mm -hmm. up a file from 2003. You can't open the mm -hmm. file, right, right, but right. you can right, open right, a right. book. You can yes. open the book to the same page, man. Uh, the other component of the community is going to probably flip you a bit that, that I felt that with every library in the community, there should be every library in the community, there should also be a roller rink. Yeah. We, I just talked to Stokely about this because the the made the big roller rink in the Twin Cities just closed in the pandemic, and Stokely did a roller it, it, he did a roller uh, roller skate jam with Snoop that really like channeled that energy, and that's one of the main things that yeah, and there's a very beautiful thing about the the infinite kind of nature of that circle, you know what I mean, and that everybody's moving in that same circle, but everybody has their own their own way of moving in the circle. Yo, man, let me tell you, man, I'm, uh, Cleveland, years ago, I did this concert. Well, really, it wasn't a concert. It was like a little promotional thing. And I showed them the skills that I had based on the Roosevelt Roller Rink, which also had a very proficient library, too. Our community had a low library and a roller rink. Mm. So I went to Cleveland, and, I, of course, I'm doing the songs, right, skating backwards as the crowd is skating with me. Of course, I'm skating backwards. And they facing me, mm. and we going around laps. Mm. I'm doing all the joints. Don't believe the hype, you know, spinning and like crazy. Yeah. How, when was it? This was recently. Nah, this was like uh, in the early '90s, not in the mid '90s, something like that. Crazy. I said, listen, I said, this is this. You never see nobody do this. Y'all ready? Come on, let's go. Let's go. Get out there. And, you know, the DJ is up there cutting, and I'm spinning like yo, you know amazing somebody falling i'm like uh, uh, let that person up you know it's like oh i still got my my backwards skate, skating skills and all that you know but uh, yeah amazing. i think i think back to rap and hip-hop man mm -hmm. you gotta also sometimes present things that had never been seen before but it doesn't have to be the ridiculous mm-hmm like I said, when you, when you and Slug are tossing ad-libs and rhymes back and forth, you like getting them on the fly and stuff like that. What you need is a curator. Like, slow this down. This is what they did. <laughs> like, whoa. Because it was so f seamless and stuff like that. It, it makes, you know, if people flock to the spectacle instead of the spectacular because the spectacular never gets properly broken down. Right. Context. Right? Context. 
Yeah, the context is is people are robbed of the context. Yeah, robbed of the context. You gotta have you got you gotta have curators, man. Historical context, has. cultural context, communal context, uh, and, and 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 in all those things is the fullness of humanity. It's like it's, yep. it's 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 the same. It's it's an extension of enslaved people not being able to know who their family is, what their language is, what their tribe is. It's like we we yep. remove the context, and then we re- remove your connection to the meaning of it all, and then we just got you as a machine, and you feed and, yep. you, and you just feed the machine. You're just the you're just the labor. And then those that came before us, mm-hmm. you got to always ask yourself, how do you honor the pain? Right. How do you honor that pain? Those mm-hmm. that came before you and, and, and paved, paved the road. A lot of times, Ali, we can never use the word we so liberally. You're like, we, yeah, we we suffered here. We, you know, we, we were slaves. You're like, oh, pump the brakes. <laughs> you have mm-hmm. to earn that we, and sometimes... When you honor that pain, that's to just begin to be able to say we. And that has to come with all the effort that you are doing to be able to consolidate the we that's around us in the here and now. Because mm-hmm. we should not be so easy to say. We have to honor that pain. And there's a lot of pain by so many who are no longer here. I mean, people was asking me like, yo, man, you, you know, what's the difference between now and fight the power that y'all did in 1989? And the biggest answer was like, there's people that were in the middle of the mix in 1989 who are no longer here. And there's people who mm-hmm. are 25 and 30 years old that was just born around that time who are now in the middle mm-hmm. of the mix trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. You know, time moves on and, and it has a chapters of the people that's going to deal with that time in that time. So we have to also be aware of that too. So that's why we're, sometimes we can't always say, haven't we done this before? Didn't we go through this before? Mm, maybe not. <laughs> this is why you want to, you want to destroy things like systemic racism because it's a stench inside the system. So you want to kind of destroy that system or what's in that system that still happens to spew and stink. So, you know, you, you don't want to get into the language of destroying people because they're just portals for whatever that system access, you know, emits. So, hmm. Hmm. yeah. Man, we're, we're, uh, we're going, I mean, me and you have done this for six hours at a time, but we're at two now. <laughs> and I know you've already had a long, a long day and a long week and, you know, I just want to say, man, I'm I'm so grateful to you. You know, I was I I was grateful to God for you before ever meeting you. Like if I never met you, if it was, if I only had the inspiration of you and just the the ability to witness you and especially to live at the same time as you. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's like living at the same time as Malcolm X or Frederick Douglass or the, you know these these great people, and um and then you know meeting you and being able to call you a friend and a brother and uh you know a teacher and a mentor and you know all of the above is just you know i can't thank god enough it, i actually came home one time from we were in australia and we were performing the same festival me and slug and ant were on stage and you came and and so we're sitting there rocking and when you talk about sneaking up behind people i'm sitting there rocking and i'm like oh man we're kind of killing it kind of hard tonight <laughs> and i turn around and there you are yeah I didn't, we hadn't seen each other yet and it's just like yo and like i just i punch, I punch slug in the stomach like i actually heard him i was like bang i was like oh, up there. And you turn around and then you all were playing across the street mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so we came across the street to walk you and you came and grabbed me and you said ali what's your favorite public enemy song i was like probably fight the power all right you're doing fight the power tonight said, what you talking about <laughs> so we got to the joint you handed me the mic and you're like you do it and i yeah, yeah, and I came back and wrote a song called "Fresh Air." Yeah, and I started in the song saying, "I'm the luckiest son of a bitch that ever lived." That's based on that experience in my life. Right, you know what I mean? It's like there's no Grammy, there's no millions, there's no nothing. There's like nothing that anybody could, that I would trade with anybody in the world uh, that that's equal to to just knowing you and and loving you and just being in the world with you, man. Yeah, man, and so I'm um, deeply grateful. Yeah, and you know and. 
and uh, a partner, the wonder wife uh, of mine and in my lifetime. Um, Gay turns fifty tomorrow, in a, really in, a, in twenty mm-hmm. minutes. And uh, we've we've said family Salute time. Salute to Dr. Gay yep. Teresa Johnson. Yep. So uh, you know, it's 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 a good it's a good thing. You know, uh, she helped me usher in my fifty. You know, and, and we're always fa- and we're always family. You know, like family is always family. You know, um, when you're together, or not we always together, and you, and you raise, raise family, and that's how I've always been. With you know, with is, is we are always extended. We family, a matter of fact. You know, so you know, it's 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 a beautiful thing, and I'm really um, mm-hmm. honored to to help her. Uh, Usher in a fifty, so and 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 and, and Usher and the fact that we always uh, talk about the day that I poured syrup on your pancakes. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. So, man, God bless you. Give you a, a long life. Protect you from every harm. Give you every all of your greatest dire, desires and, and dreams to the best of your intentions. Be on your wildest dreams. Yeah, man. And uh, man. Love you. All right. See you soon, inshallah. Extra special thanks to the legendary, iconic, homie, hero, mentor, leader, teacher, guide, force of nature, gentle giant, brother, son, uh, father, Rhyme Animal, the incredible Chuck D from Public Enemy. Extra special thank you so much to him for being so generous and gracious with his time and wisdom and witness. Special birthday shout out to Dr. Gay Teresa Johnson. We love you and we appreciate you so much. Please make sure to like and share and subscribe and comment and rate. It helps the podcast reach more people who may be interested and may benefit. Head to brotherali.com for all the information about the podcast, about the Traveler's Tour, for merchandise, for information about all of my releases all of my entire catalog i wrote little pieces on blurbs for each part of my catalog that are there that you can check out there are also videos and things to click on and listen to and watch there's also a section for booking where you can request an interview or a speaking engagement or a verse or a beat or whatever it is that you would like to ask of your brother ali I want to give an extra special thanks to Amna Mirza, Mansour Panawala, Last Word, Amar Rahman, to my brother Ant for producing the theme music for the Travelers podcast, my man Darian Washington, and a special thanks to Mark from Medina, who designed the Travelers logo stamp. We love it, and we appreciate you very much. The Travelers podcast is produced by Brendan BK1 Kelly and is a production of Travelers Media. Thank you so very much, and as always, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.